Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this webinar and the launch of the sixth edition of the African Investing for Impact Barometer. Um, it's, a, it's, it's an honor and pleasure to invite er, any, everyone to this. Um, we got a, we've got quite a full agenda today, um, quite a bit to cover over the next hour. Um, so I'd just like to give a quick overview of the agenda and what we'll be covering. Uh, just moving on to the next slide. So um, from doing this overview, I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to Malcolm Fair. He's the managing director um, at Riskira. Next on the agenda, we'll have Dr. Stephanie Kim Kaporo. Um, she's the brainchild of, of the, um, the barometer, as well as an impact guru. Um, from there, we will hear, um, uh, we will have a panelist discussion that will, which will be moderated by Moisi Damini. Um, he's the lead researcher um, for the barometer, um, coordinator, coordinator, and overall Ninja Supremo um, for this research project. Um, and then from there, we will have a brief Q&A session um, and, and closing remarks. Um, just on um, the panelists we and people involved in this webinar, as well as in the research, just, just quick, quick bio. Just some housekeeping rules we'd like to cover. Um, any questions um, that you all have um, during the webinar, if you could just direct those to the comment box. We will do our absolute best to um, cover those questions during the Q&A session. Um, any questions that we, we don't get to, um, we apologize for, but we will respond to um, following this webinar event. Um, so with that, thank you everyone for joining um, and for attending. Um, over, you, to, over to you, Malcolm. Thank you, Adam. Um, just hoping everyone can see me there. And uh, for those of you on the continent, good afternoon. I hope it's a good afternoon for you. And, and for those of you joining us from um, uh, uh, either the Asia or the US region, good evening and, and good morning, respectively. Um, so Riskira's role here is really uh, as a co-sponsor of the project and um, uh, co-researchers to assist uh, the UCT Graduate School of Business in, in this project. Uh, Riskira is a global, a global purpose-driven investment firm, and uh, we play a leadership role in the investment industry across the African continent uh, with offices in seven different countries, which was enormously helpful in us um, uh, uh, performing the research for, for, the, for the barometer. Um, what, what I think when I was thinking about today and the introduction for it, I, what I thought about was that um, for all of us on this call, I think what we all have in common is that at some level, uh, we're passionate about the future of the African continent. You know, why else would we be on this call? This is a call about um, investment that has an impact. Um, and it's about investment that has an impact, particularly in Africa. Um, and so if you're already invested, if you're thinking about investing, um, uh, or if you're an investment professional on this continent, you know, I think all of us have something that that, that part in common is that we're passionate about um, investing here. And uh, for those of you thinking about investing on this continent, we'd, we'd love to have you invest, invest here. And uh, we hope that today's report um, allows you to, to uh, draw a, pic a picture of the size of assets that, that's actually already invested, um, utilizing one or other um, investment for impact strategy. Um, and I think the headline number of $337.2 billion is already um, a huge number for this continent in investment terms and, uh, and something that all of us should look to build through time and contribute to, to having more impact. And so with that, I'd, I'd like to hand over to Stephanie um, to take us through the research and, uh, and wish that all of you uh, would enjoy this, this research and contribute in your own ways to having more impact in future. Thank you. Hello, everybody. So I'm going to share my screen. Do you, do you see it? Okay, so 
what I'm going to do, so, so I'm Stephanie Giampocaro, I'm uh, an associate professor, um, and uh, I've kind of, uh, as Adam was saying, I, I, kind of, I was the, the brainchild behind the barometer a couple of years ago in 2013. So what I propose to do today is to introduce you the, the African Investing for Impact uh, uh, project. After I will go through some of the results that we found, and I will uh, have some concluding remarks on the state of play and uh, where we should be going next. So in terms of, of what the barometer is about, uh, it's about, um, it's the only Pan-African um, sur market survey on investing for impact on the continent, to my, to my knowledge. And, um, and this is uh, not only a market survey, but dynamic benchmark tool uh, to measure the impact of different FI strategy in a unique format. And um, this research project started in 2013 and brought together uh, myself, which was the senior researcher on that, and a uh, junior researcher at the University of Cape Town, uh, such as Lisa, which was a uh, junior at the time, and now is uh, is quite senior because he's doing a lot of job uh, of work for, um, with me on the barometer. And we have other uh, graduates you know, um, from the Master of Environmental Finance who worked on the project with us. Uh, such actually Tebo, who is now is an ASG analyst at Sanlam and be part of the of the panel. And um, the project, as Malcolm was saying, is the testimony of the African continent vibrancy and ability to innovate regarding investment strategy, uh, um, which incorporate ESG. And the the new thing with the, with this barometer is that um, it's. Um, uh, it's a new partnership with Riscora. It's the first time that we are doing the barometer with Riscora, and it was really a privilege to work uh, with their team which, uh, and their professionalism. And uh, that was uh, um, really a great support for us to be able to release uh, this, um, this new edition, which won't, won't have been possible without them. Um, so, what we what we surveyed in this um, in this barometer, uh, what we did uh, like uh, other years is um, we start to look at uh, a number of funds that are managed, uh, which were this time 206, uh, 2640. and from there uh, we start to to try to understand which are. Uh, investing for impact funds. And as you can see, uh, when we start to look for the in investing for impact funds, uh, the number of funds is, um, is um, less important. So, and we do that in Southern Africa, West Africa, and East Africa. Uh, so maybe not all of you are familiar with the term I-5 strategies. Uh, so what, when we say I-5 strategy, uh, we basically uh, talk about all this uh, strategy that you may have heard of uh, called ESG integration, investor engagement, screening, sustainability seam investment, and impact investment that you will um, normally uh, get in any uh, survey that is done in Europe or in other parts of the world, uh, um, such as the, the Global Sustainable Investment Alliance, where uh, you can um, see uh, what's going on uh, in these different strategies. So when we say IFI strategy, we are talking about these strategies. So, and so what do we do? Uh, we score um, this um, impact strategy, uh, this uh, investing for impact strategy. So here you can see all the scoring work. So we have a system of low, medium, and high, and, uh, and, um, and we have indicators uh, to, to get uh, the, the, the strategy that we looked at to be, uh, uh, to be uh, scored. And uh, we, have, uh, we can identify like that leaders in implementation while a uh, fund manager who lead in comparison to peers implementing the same IFI strategy based on information where we source in the public domain, but also some information we got from, uh, from questionnaires uh, uh, from uh, some fund managers. And so uh, you get uh, to a, a point system uh, as we can see there. 
Um, now um, I'm going to uh, go through the, the main insight uh, from the African Investing for Impact Barometer, and I will do that um, per session. So here uh, you can see uh, that um, Southern Africa, uh, which is one of the regions we survey, uh, we have Southern Africa, West Africa, and East Africa, uh, is in pole position as a previous edition with uh, uh, 613 billion US dollar. Uh, and uh, if you look at the, the weight of the IFI strategy as percentage of total assets, uh, you can see that uh, it's ESG integration and investor en and screening and investor engagement, which are the, the, the biggest uh, strategy uh, in Southern Africa. And uh, if you look at the size of assets managed by IFA strategy expressed as a uh, US, as, uh, US uh, dollar, you also, what you can see for Southern Africa uh, compared to the other region is that uh, it's the asset managers uh, which are uh, leading that market more than the private equity and uh, venture capital um, uh, player. Um, and um, we also, um, we, are, we have that in that, uh, in that Southern Africa market. So, if we look at the barometer scoring results and, um, and the top three of, uh, this, um, of, uh, of um, the scoring that we done, um, you can see uh, that, um, that um, uh, it's uh, actually in investor engagement that we have the most uh, um, high, high score uh, compared to other strategy. Uh, and it's uh, in a screening that things are a bit less, uh, um, uh, less uh, good in terms of high score. And uh, in terms of the, the, the top three uh, in asset manager and private equity and VC, uh, we have uh, players such as 91, Sanlam, uh, Old Mutual. Uh, in private equity, uh, if we look at impact investing, we have, uh, uh, for example, um, future growth. If we look at sustainability sim investment, we got summit. Um, so you have kind of that sense of uh, who is um, really uh, performing well in being a leader in implementation in this strategy. If so, now I will move to my West Africa. And actually, West Africa this year is the runner-up after uh, Southern Africa. Uh, and, um, and you can see a bit of a different picture here, where it's actually uh, more sustainability sim investment and impact investment, which are uh, uh, the, the, the strategy we are representing the biggest weight in terms of total assets. And uh, it's a market which is really driven by the PVC uh, type of investor. Um, if um, we look at the, at the scoring results and the top three, uh, here again, um, here actually it's ESG integration, which has the biggest uh, uh, type of um, high score. And, um, and actually, sustainability sim investment doesn't score a high score, but have more like a, a medium type of score. And, um, and in terms of the... Um, all the players. So here we don't make the difference between AM and, and P and VC. And uh, you got some of these big um, uh, private equity players such as Carlisle. Uh, you have um, also uh, some, uh, some player like Sail Capital um, and, uh, and Oasis, uh, which are also, um, also present. And um, we are also um, in, um, in East Africa. Uh, so East Africa is closing in third position uh, with uh, USD 18 billion. Uh, so here uh, we have more, um, um, a more equilibrate equi um, 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 weight of this strategy where they are all a bit kind of the same. And uh, again, we got the PE and VC uh, in, uh, in, uh, in first position in terms of leading that market. And uh, if we look at the, at the barometer scoring results and the top three, 
uh, we can see, um, yes, that um, that ESG integration is also um, quite per performing well in terms of score uh, compared to um, to screening, for example, which we don't have a, a, um, a lot of, uh, we don't have any high score uh, in that category. And in terms of the of the top three, uh, you can see a mix of uh, of African uh, investor and uh, and some uh, foreigner investor uh, such as uh, North Fund, for for example. Um, so that's um, that's a bit that gives you a sense of the of the regional highlights. Uh, that the barometer gives you, and so it gives you that Pan African feel about these different uh, markets. So, in terms of the, the trends uh, that uh, we have uh, unpacked, uh, let's um, let's see. Uh, so, uh, from the beginning of the of the project, I think something was really important for us: that question of impact, and how we could translate that question impact through that uh, research project. That's why we created the scoring system and uh, and all the and all that aspect, and not only looking at the market size. And what we found interesting is to actually compare the market size and what uh, or what is the percentage of asset allocated to different IFA strategy versus the percentage of leader in leaders in implementation, which are the people uh, who are actually um, having this high score. And um, previous year, we had kind of a very um, clear picture where the high score were in uh, synergy seam and impact investment and not really in the other categories. But things have kind of changed this, uh, this time because uh, actually in ESG integration and investor engagement, we have really a lot of things going on. Uh, so um, some, some actors have been, have been being quite good at uh, disclosing and disclosing and being more and more able to measure what they actually do in terms of impact so that you can see uh, with um, investor engagement. Uh, this is not really the case with screening, uh, which actually is the big, second biggest uh, uh, strategy where you see like there, there was really an issue in terms of being able to measure, to disclose what you do. And, uh, and sustainability seems also not that uh, obvious that these things are happening, whereas in impact investment, which has been historically a market where uh, there is really a big effort to uh, measure the impact. Uh, this is quite, they, they have good score on that size, but uh, in their case, uh, in that case, there is not a lot of assets uh, on that IFA strategy. So there was really that question of, can more money be invested in, uh, in uh, strategies such as impact investment who are really good at measuring the impact, which are more the, the private um, listed space? And uh, what else can be done in the more, um, in the more um, listed space like integration and engagement to go even further? Even so, we can say this year that this edition that things have uh, really improved, but with a big uh, kind of lack uh, with screening. Uh, so to wrap up on that, so what I was saying in terms of ESG integration and investor engagement, there is improvement. You have an ESG professionalization, notably in Southern Africa, where there is a recruiting of ESG teams, uh, the uh, fund manager are purchasing more and more ESG third party resource, uh, they have this dedicated engagement capacity, not only on governance, but also on E and uh, social aspect. Uh, whereas on screening, screening remains very uh, negative type of screening where you avoid to invest in some uh, stocks based on um, often moral and religious uh, beliefs. And you don't have a lot of room in that market uh, for a best in class uh, or best in universe type of screening. Uh, you really could have more innovation there uh, in uh, the stream uh, region we surveyed. Sustainability seam investing is boosted by grow the growth of social and environmental infrastructure appetite on the continent, but uh, there is not much effort done there to measure impact in a very, um, very uh, proactive way. Where, which compares to the space of impact investing, where there, there was a lot of effort to measure your impact, to have a theory of change, and, and to be very, very proactive on this aspect. 
but there the, the potential there is still largely untapped in terms of um, assets under management. So eventually, uh, to conclude my uh, presentation, um, what is the future? And what we can do uh, uh, to avoid greenwashing, and that can be an exciting uh, road ahead, actually. So our conclusion uh, with the project and uh, with the, all the researcher and we are working on it, it's we think that there is a necessity for the African investment industry uh, and also for an investor who invests in Africa to embrace further IFI strategy. Uh, to professionalize and sophisticate their IFI strategy processes, and to dedicate more resources to innovate on measuring IFI strategy impact, uh, notably to understand how they are going to have an impact on the sustainable development of the African continent, which is very important if you think about question of climate change and, and SDGs, for example. And we do think that these efforts, like in other parts of the world, are likely to be galvanized and supported by two things. The fact that you have in the three regions, the stock market, we are really making efforts to muscle the listing requirement on ESG on very different fronts, and uh, are also developing green and sustainable bond markets, which could have an impact on uh, the, the, the player we are, we are observing. And also the fact that financial market regulators are passing stronger requirements on companies and investors uh, on the climate change space, especially, and we have seen uh, recently uh, the green taxonomy uh, from National Treasury in South Africa, which is echoing what's going on uh, in Europe and other parts of the world, which show that Africa is moving at the same pace uh, in many ways. Uh, in some uh, region than uh, the general um, the general market. So this is um, my um, my my last slide. So I'm going to hand uh, in uh, to uh, Lisa, uh, who is going to moderate to moderate the panel session. So I'm going to to stop to share now and uh, and give him uh, the the mic. Thank you, Stephanie. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us this afternoon. So our panel discussion was really just to unpack some of the developments that happened within some of our leading fund managers um, from the demonstration of implementation when it comes to those various IFI strategies that Stephanie has gotten into. So you'll recall from Malcolm Fair's um, introduction that you know he highlighted our pursuit to understand where assets are allocated and how they're allocated to various environmental, social, or governance initiatives um, to create a positive impact. And, but most, most importantly, what we were really after is to really have an understanding of how these fund managers are actually demonstrating the impact. So it's one thing to speak about, you know, that you integrate ESG and that you engage or that you um, that you, um, you know, engage in impact investment, but what is the impact of all these strategies? And in this particular edition, which is now five years after our previous edition, we decided that we, we needed to, to basically apply a bit more pressure even in how we are, you know, scoring our, uh, the fund managers whom we are uh, surveying in the study. So you will see that even uh, between the previous edition and this one, we have added uh, additional scoring criteria, but across all the strategies, we had a very big focus on to what extent are there hu the human resources and other resources that are pumped into making sure that impact is achieved, but also demonstrated. But we're also looking at to what extent is the impact of the strategy being communicated by these fund managers who are managing all these assets. So in terms of the, uh, our panel discussion, we invited uh, one of the leaders in the AM space, which is the asset manager space. Uh, these are the large uh, fund managers who have shown a lot of improvement since the last barometer in terms of how they communicate what they are doing in the various strategies and even the products they've developed. And we've also then invited um, a PEVC um, 
representative through summit and Langa would be uh, the representative there to really get a a, a difference and an understanding of the picture on what our asset manager is dealing with compared to your to your um, to your private equity uh, and venture capital companies, and then we also have the privilege of having Misha from the Bertha Center. And what we really wanted to do with that is to say, you know, we can look at the trees being Sanlam, you know, Debohode and Langa uh, from Summit, but how what is happening in terms of the forest? So I would really like to just open up um, the questions in terms of the discussion to have a great understanding from, um, I'll start with you, Deboho, uh, from SIM. Um, and, you know, Deboho is also a former researcher on this barometer. It's really great to have you. Thank you. Um, what I was really interested in is to get an understanding, you know, since I mentioned that it's been five years since our last barometer, what have the, what has SIM for in this instance, as one of our impact leaders and our, um, and our implementation leaders, what have they done from a strategic and an organizational perspective to really get, you know, get themselves to where they are in this IFI journey? Thanks, Tolisa, and yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here with everyone. Um, yeah, as you say, you know, like impact and just any of the IFA strategies, it's a journey really. Um, you just start on a journey and improve over time. I think uh, same from a strategic perspective, at the beginning of the journey was uh, just having those strategic uh, partnerships with uh, leaders in the space. So one of our key partnerships was with Rubeco who are uh, sustainability leaders and really understand the space and were leaders in their own space uh, in this, in, in this uh, IFI strategies. And just working with them, seeing exactly how can we leverage some of the knowledge, what can we work from them? Um, and then also just uh, using these quite a few resources available uh, in terms of understanding reporting standards, requirements, you know, um, yeah, there's GRI, SABS, and more specific Iris Plus for impact investing, um, familiarizing yourself with the space and knowing what's there. And then I think taking it a bit further was um, is interesting to see Stephanie on uh, some of the remarks shown how the professionalization of ESG and impact getting specialist. I think building that in-house capabilities now to sort of um, make sure that you can implement. So it's good that you have partners, but now if you want to roll it out throughout the business and just making sure that inside you can uh, build those strategic movements and have uh, those capabilities built out and systems to help you uh, integrate measurement um, policies as well as frameworks to help you in that implementation. Um, and it's a journey and you continue as you go and start uh, even creating products that help you in impact investing specifically, like we launched our first uh, impact fund, the legacy fund, which was jobs, uh, job focused during COVID uh, in 2020. And yeah, you continue to improve from there. Thank you. Um... Um, Lang, I'd like to move to you. Uh, I mean, with uh, private equity firms, they're typically not as big as your asset management firms. So it will be very interesting to kind of have, get a sense from an organization like yours um, in terms of what have been those kind of organizational decisions and strategic decisions you've had to make around how you approach investing for impact. Yeah, um, thank you very much, Polisa. I, I think um, with us as a starting point, the first thing that we did was to make um, impact investing, ESG, transformation and diversity underpins for our business. So we first had to start with looking at ourselves and how we apply um, the elements of ESG within our own business, whether it was our own social contribution, our own governance structures, our own impact on governance uh, and diversity. And then after that, it was a, mostly a learning exercise to make sure that everyone who's in the team, because you don't necessarily get the same scale as you have alluded to, was au okay fait with what uh, ESG is, how it works, what we are considering and how we're measuring it um, within the different uh, setups within which we invest. And then from there, I think our evolution has come to a point where 
we are also starting to have uh, specialists who are focused on ESG, but that doesn't at any point detract from the role the whole entire team has to be playing in terms of making sure that we at any point when we're making investments, at any point when we are existing as a business, we're continuing to contribute towards driving uh, impact. And I think a, a second factor that has helped us has been the pool of investors that we have have spoken to um, their own ethos around uh, ESG. And part of that has then translated into the parameters around which we can invest. We've been fortuitous amongst others to have the uh, British International Investments, formerly CDC as one of the investors in our fund, Alex Forbes, who have also helped us uh, to shape our own um, ethos around our investments. And then last but not least, I uh, hoping Polisa doesn't get a big head. It always helps to have people in the industry who are your friends and colleagues who are sharing best practice um, as you have done in terms of how there's thinking around climate change, just transition, and a couple of other issues. And those conversations are things that we have not taken lightly in forming our own ethos. Thank you. Uh, I definitely don't have a big head unless it's physical. <laughs> physical big head. Uh, thank you for that. Um, Misha, I'm, I'm interested to get your perspective. Um, uh, just as background, the barometer was uh, a project that we did under the auspices of the Bertha Center um, in the previous edition before we we, we joined forces with uh, Riskira. And I'd like to look at you um, in terms of the market as market developers my apologies we have sensors here that need to be you need to move for the lights to stay on um so sorry misha so misha um uh, i don't know if you're able to give us a sense of what you've observed in terms of developments around you know organizations that are trying to um, show their impact and, and and channel money towards um you know environmental outcomes that are positive or social out, uh, outcomes that are positive. And it'd be nice to also get a sense, you know, from a continental perspective, because I know you've done interesting work as the, invest, uh, the innovative finance team, which also feeds into some of these strategies. Thank you so much, um, Tolisa. Um, good luck with your light situation there. Um, I think in terms of what is going on in um, ESG and you know the, the measurement of impact, you can see from your report, I think it's wonderfully covered. It goes all the way from ESG, ranging all the way to impact investing. And I just wanna um, point out the nuances of the level of measurement and the approach to measurement of impact that each of those different buckets has. Um, on the one hand, ESG is very much at the moment rules-based, um, very, st very structured in terms of reporting, whereas impact investing on the opposite end of the scale is intrinsic to the definition of what impact investing is. And um, just further to that, I think you've got SMMEs, asset managers who all have different resources dedicated to, to the measurement of impact. Some, some, some of them, the investment team themselves just pivots and does a little bit of the ESG work. Um, with others, they hire a third party consultant or have an in-house team that they train and they develop for, for um, their measurement of impacts. SMMEs on the other hand and businesses that uh, you're investing in the target projects, they themselves have different resources available to them. Um, I think Tepoja did a great job of, of listing a couple of those resources, but the application and the interpretation of them is still very broad. And so that is the one thing I will say we've observed is um, it, it when it comes down to the nitty gritty of um, the definitions and the processes of managing and measuring it, they are very varied. Um, we then also um, had a, an ITF a task force, an impact task force that under the auspices of the G7 was um, commissioned to understand exactly how we can scale impact for investment. And one of their work streams actually focused on accelerating impact transparency, harmonization, and integrity of um, capital flows so that we can achieve the, the SDGs and a just transition and all of these other 
um, uh, social and environmental goals that we have. And one of the major, major um, uh, recommendations there has been that we all need to work together because we're all at different places. So if you're a little bit ahead on the curve, or as Tabucha mentioned, a little bit ahead on this journey, please come back and tell us what you found out there because that is the only way we're all gonna reach the same level and, and achieve some sort of um, um, transparency, consistency, and harmonization, I would say. In terms of the African continent more broadly, um, we work with our um, African peers through the Global Steering Group for Impact Investing, also um, uh, mandated out of a G7 mandate. And what they've, what the colleagues there and I have often discussed is that Africa is really where you measure impact. Um, and I saw there was a comment in the chat about, you know, the European and American um, measurements being um, less, I don't know what was the word, but maybe less advanced or less mature. And I think that sounds about right. As much as there's an, uh, a, a massive rush um, for ESG positions or impact measurement positions globally, um, we see this from asset managers, from advisory firms, uh, kind of the big four consulting firms, there's a massive um, uh, gap for, for impact measurement, ESG measurement professionals. But I think where we've learned in Africa is that, what we've learned in Africa is that we sit in the middle of a bit of a measurement test lab. And so we're seeing the real changes happening and we're seeing the nuances of be able to, being able to measure them. Um, and I'm getting similar feedback from other emerging countries, especially uh, my colleagues in Asia, who also say that uh, they're on the ground and they're measuring um, real impacts um, from, from, um, from that perspective. Thank you, Misha. You, you know, you raised some interesting points, which I'd like to um, just ride on in terms of um, engaging with Devoho and Langa. So one of the things you were talking about is impact transparency and integrity. And you, mean, and you also, um, you know, uh, spoke about the actual measurement of impact and kind of approaches. And it's interesting that, um, I, I mean, I didn't see that, that, um, that comment around, you know, the differences between maybe, you know, the North Americans and the Europeans in terms of the approach, um, which leads me to, to my questions to Debo Ho and Ulanga. Uh, maybe let's start with you, uh, Langa. In terms of your your decisions around how you're going to measure impact, if at all, and where you know to what extent you'll be transparent and disclose this. Um, what kind of philosophy has informed your practices thus far, and where do you see some kind of improvement in, in or if any, <laughs> in terms of how you you approach issues of transparency and uh, impact measurement? Yeah, so I think um, our approach has was one way our framework was built on the basis of trying to understand all the frameworks that uh, existed for impact investing. And I think that's probably one of the most difficult elements about all of this is the fact that there's so many ways to measure it. Uh, and then the second uh, element after we had gone and looked at as many of them as we possibly could, was to find the ones that we thought were best suited for firstly um, our investment sectors that would be looking to invest in and then secondly the ones that we thought were uh, appropriate for our investment universe from a geographical perspective uh, because I think uh, as Misha said it's quite nuanced and there's very specific differences which are also linked to where uh, in the world you currently sit uh, and I think the one thing that we have then gone on and done there is to ensure that we have then built a framework and then subscribed to many of the organizations that are custodians of these benchmarks to ensure that we are opening up accountability in terms of how we're doing this. But over and above that, we've also made ourselves uh, very much accountable to our investors undertaking commitments to produce a report on our ESG performance uh, at least twice a year, um, to which ends I think our last one came out towards the end of uh, last week. And we actually then hold uh, report back sessions and even an AGM where we talk in great detail about what it is that we're specifically doing uh, on ESG uh, transformation diversity. 
And you will find that in our AGM, actually the portion on ESG is allotted the biggest slot because we think it's one of the key areas where that transparency has not necessarily been there to the extent that it is required. In terms of how we feel we can improve, I think it's mostly about gathering the data. I think we've done our best to automate how we collect the data for our investing companies to make it simpler and faster and also allow us to be able to check. But I think there's still room uh, for us to be able to make it even more efficient and to make sure that maybe in some instances and for some segments of the reporting, one can actually have a live view of what is actually happening around those uh, particular statistics which are of significance um, within the business and for the investors and for the communities. No, thank you, uh, Laga. That, that, that's very insightful. Um, I'd like to move to you, Deboho. I mean, uh, it, it will be very interesting to really get a sense from someone who was on the other side critiquing fund managers, and now you're on the other side uh, where you are doing impact measurement and um, you know ESG integration. So how how do you understand the philosophy of SIM, if there is one, around approaching measurement of impact? And to what extent is it apply, applied across the various um, IFI strategies that you have been um, playing in? Because effectively, with you being in such a, such a big organization that has all these various portfolios, it, it seems that you, you touch on all the, the you know, in, on that spectrum of IFI strategies. So um, please, can you just unpack that for us? Yeah, I think, um... Well, first, the comment on being on the one side and the other. I think when you're outside, it's very easy to critique. Um, and you take it that companies um, or asset managers in general are not making any movements. But being on the inside, I think what I do appreciate is the commitment to impact measurement and really doing it well, but also just understanding the complexity and that it's hard and it's a journey. And there's various stakeholders to, to engage with, uh, to sort of work with um, along the journey. Um, so yeah, there's definitely willingness, but I think uh, it's it's not as quick as you think on the outside, it, it looks like. I think Misha touched on that, on just sharing. Um, yeah, so across uh, measurement would look different. So like for the listed sites, I think that's a bit more easy in terms of availability of data. Um, there is, uh, I mean, you mentioned there's uh, being in a big organization, you could subscribe to some of the companies that offer this data. I mean, there's uh, sustainability and sustainalytics, MSCI, which offer you gradings and just scoring on that data. And as well as I mentioned, a partnership with Rebecca where you can get ESG research on specific companies, which will help you with uh, investor engagement, uh, one of the IFI strategies, um, as well as, yeah, just going back in, in your proxy voting, how you're going to vote based on where the company is, um, and in your scoring and just the key KPIs you look at you can include them in the integration. So you see a, a, a lot of like the, just the integration and investor engagement play more on the listed side. Um, the screening will play both on alternatives and listed side. Um, and, but I guess the screens would differ where we use uh, ethical screens across. Um, and on the private side, it depends on, on which funds we have. Um, so would apply, say it's, we're looking at energy would be a bit more, uh, we can play some green screens, you know, you see ESG screens, uh, but mostly I think ethical, like the barometer said, is still the most popular form of screening that happens. Um, measurement on the private, on alternatives is a bit tricky. I think, as I say, there's no sustainalytics or MSCI there. Uh, and Langa alluded to this, you need to collect data. Uh, and therefore you need the right systems in place. And especially if um, you don't have, I mean, cause you've got investment teams who work across and collect data, uh, they do the investment job and they have to do ESG. So you wanna make it as seamless as possible because you won't spend time collecting um, 
uh, ESG data or impact data across. Um, so the key thing is just getting the right frameworks, uh, the right policies frameworks, which you apply uh, from uh, due diligence in terms of understanding with the various businesses where they are uh, in terms of ESG, um, and also what the S is picture, what are their commitments? Uh, what are they able to do? So a business in uh, private equity, which is a bit bigger, will be different from an SME. Uh, sometimes in private equity, they have their in-house ESG personnel who you can engage. But with the SME, you know that you're limited in data. Um, they don't have that kind of information or even the capability uh, to, to work that journey, so you walk with them. Uh, the, the, I think the challenge is that if you want to do deep impact and you really want to measure, uh, this is now specific to impact investing, um, it's hard to, to collect data that aligns to the KPIs that really drive impact. Say, for example, you're looking at affordable housing and you're targeting um, a certain uh, income bracket, low to middle income. Uh, to measure that those housing is offered to that particular group, it's really hard. And like, it's more than the investee or the property investing in, it's like the, benef the end beneficiaries that you wanna measure. And I think that's where there's still that disconnect in terms of uh, measurements and the outcomes and KPIs that we'd wanna see improve more. So definitely data collection uh, on the impact side uh, and just ensuring that we are really just um, achieving the impact we want um, and really moving the needle in terms of uh, bringing that change in society. Thank you, thank you. Uh, this sounds very complex <laughs> and I'm sure we, you, you know, it will take a, even a, a huge research paper to see how the large uh, asset owners or investors are doing this. Um, I'd like to now ask the final question so that we can get to Q&A. And Misha, I wanted to really get a sense from you in terms of, again, the issue of transparency and, um, and uh, demonstration of the impact. Um, one of the biggest challenges we faced in conducting this research is that um, I think you, you have a lot more transparency from the Southern African players. Um, and then when you went to East and West Africa, we really had to dig for information. And I don't know if maybe it's a cultural thing. So it would be very interesting to get a sense from you in terms of um, how do you, I mean, what do you see with when you are interacting with your colleagues around issues of transparency and um, uh, disclosure and actual measurement of impact? Uh, because it, it seems to be there's a lot of action, but no one, you know, we're not seeing it publicly displayed. Yeah, so I think that's a good question. I think so, uh, so Southern Africa and South Africa in particular, um, having one of the you know, better or mature financial um, systems, especially with our exchange and, you know, with public listed companies having their requirements, that really makes a, a massive difference. And what we're really hoping is that other African countries can, you know, will also get to that stage where the exchanges are holding them accountable in the listed, in the listed space. That's a big move and a big recommendation for them. Um, and then what we're also seeing is around the, the, the difference between investee companies and what resources and understanding they have of measuring. So it's not a matter of not disclosing. It's just that sometimes they haven't baked in that measurement function from the beginning. And then all of a sudden an investor comes in and now they all of a sudden need different measurements, um, different metrics and, and different processes in place. And so really what, what we're speaking to them about is baking in from the start that measurement team process understanding from the beginning, regardless of which investor comes along. And so you've got an understanding as a project or as an investee that, that supersedes any sort of investor requirement in and of itself, because that will improve disclosure already. Um, we have a lot of colleagues saying also that having boots on the ground is so important. So sometimes you can get 
um, investors that are not even based in that region or based in that country. And so then that becomes a whole disconnect all by itself. Um, understanding what, what local context and local metrics and local challenges there are or opportunities there are for measuring and disclosing um, more effectively. So those are the two kind of recommendations is on the one hand, making sure that um, the regulators and the exchanges are putting in place those, those metrics and helping develop the ecosystem also, because that's you know the level of development that is required. But then also on the other end, making sure that um, investees understand from the beginning, it's not just about saying, here's my slide and these are the SDGs that I support, but really going in there and understanding as to Deborah's point, what am I measuring? And is this going to change impact? And further than that, when we're down that line, how do I use these metrics to improve my impact? So not just this is the impact to the end, but how do I feed back that, that results-based um, um, approach to improve my next round of, of operations or investments? <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. I think you've given us ideas on how to be a bit more stringent with our criteria, because I, I you know, at, in this particular one, we were really focusing on can you actually show the impact, but you know, how do you constantly show it? And, and I suppose that should be and one of the things we we look at, and I guess also we need to be. And more cognizant around the negative impacts, which are sometimes overlooked because the positive impacts are so great. Uh, but thank you so much, and thank you to Debuho and Langa for the for the discussion. I'd like to uh, hand over to Adam, who will be uh, facilitating our Q and A. And yeah, and I hope um, you, we're able to answer some of the questions. I see Graham there with your questions and Carl Renan. Uh, so take it away, please, Adam. Thank you, Moisa. Um, okay, so we'll move on to the Q&A section uh, of the webinar. Um, we've got a, a few questions in. Um, the first um, we have is from Miguel, and I'm going to direct this question towards Stephanie. I think she's quite well placed to, um, to tackle it. Um, so um, Stephanie, uh, Miguel's question is, with the scoring changes you made since the last report, how would you interpret the overall change in ESG monitoring? Are managers more accurate in measurements on, on a comparison to five years ago? Are ESG drivers attracting more growth than non-ESG? Okay, um, uh, thank you for the question, Miguel. Um, yeah, so I think the biggest uh, change we, we observed was on the um, ESG integration and, um, and, um, and investor engagement, where really clearly there, there was a huge change. And but we have a five years um, yeah, gap, which so in a way, it's a, if fortunately it happened, uh, because for a long time, um, especially in Southern Africa, there was a lot of talk about all this aspect, but not much was happening yeah, in terms of hiring people, dedicating money basically to the topic. And, and clearly that has changed. So that's a, a great development. And I think some of our panelists are a testimony of that uh, because five years ago, uh, their position didn't exist. Uh, and uh, people like Tebo or Langa, they are kind of, they're going to make all these changes and they have been hired to do these changes. So I think, uh, yes, we uh, have seen that on this strategy. Um, yeah, the screening side as a, and sustainability same, I think is a bit complex to, to see really change, but, uh, but I guess that may be happening and impact investing, as we said, has always been quite uh, dynamic and a bit of a lab for really uh, experimenting about how you are going to measure impact. Uh, which I think that can be brought back uh, to other, um, maybe to other strategies also, uh, because there is maybe inspiration there. Also, they are not doing exactly the same thing and the impact they may have is not exactly uh, the same, but they could have a bit more of that man mindset of measuring impact, I guess, uh, uh, plugged in, in this other strategy. Great, thanks, Stephanie. Um, so we have another question from Graham, and I think I will address this um, to Langa and to Boho. I think you guys are well placed. Um, so his question is, how are you making the case internally inside your investment firm 
uh, for the resources to properly research and do due diligence on your pipeline of companies um, or portfolio companies. How much RAND slash dollars are you able to dedicate to doing ESG analysis and making the investment case? So maybe start off with uh, Langa and then we can maybe move over to Boho. I was going to let the lady go first, but... <laughs> <laughs> or we can do it that way, you're a gentleman. Yes, please, Deboho, please go first. <laughs> Um, okay, thanks, Lana. Um, yeah, in terms of making a case internally, um, I, I think uh, uh, as a business, you have to have a commitment or a strategy that you, you know, you want to offer this uh, sustainable, offer sustainable finance. Um, and yeah, you want to pursue this. So I, I think if the business agrees on that, it's a bit easier to make a case. Um, and then just uh, building in frameworks for the investment teams. I think yeah, Langa also spoke about that because ESG seems to be an addition to their, uh, their day job or what they used to do, which is just like financial performance measurement. And now you're adding this extra work. So you want to make it as easy as possible. So um, if you can have a resource, get uh, the right policy framework. Um, we spoke of resources that you can get online in terms of KPIs, how you measure it. Uh, just something to help streamline the process for the team um, to get a buy-in so they're not overburdened with ESG data if they're not there. Um, and in terms of rents, I mean, it has become an expensive exercise in some way. And like, uh, I mean, it's sad to, and to do it well, um, you really do need, to, uh, I, I think over time you'd need a designated resource uh, personnel in the team uh, with changes in regulation. Stephanie spoke about the taxonomy now coming in. So someone has to like, you know, stay abreast in that and just help uh, the functionality and, and the business just get their head around that and improve their policies. So I don't know how you do it with saving, but maybe just uh, approach it slowly and it's a journey, uh, start where you can. All right, thank you, Tabaho. Vanga, do you have anything additional to add to that? Yeah, I think I fully agree with everything that uh, Deboho has said. I think if the company and the business already believes in the journey, I think then the spend is justified. But I think also there is data that shows the intrinsic value that you get from being able to have um, good uh, ESG practices. Uh, bad ESG practices result in Steinhoff, but um, good practices result in good government businesses that grow. And I think um, that has particularly helped. Um, the second thing is I think we are also seeing the outcomes of not having good ESG practices, what is happening to the environment. Uh, we are seeing the social unrest as it unfolds in the South African context as is linked to investments that is skewed in one direction. And being able to be on the core face of trying to address that and what the, the financial uplift that comes from that social element is, is also becoming obvious. I think we, saw so case studies in our own research where uh, certain places where they had community ownership schemes for properties during unrest, the properties were not affected because the community identified as part of the ownership of, of those properties. And I think um, that makes it much easier for the business case. And I think from the perspective of the amount of spend, um, you spend, what you can and what is within reason. I think there's no one size fits all in terms of how much it will cost you to do diligence a particular business because of its own uh, nuanced uh, elements that are built into that business, into that sector. And therefore financial services, for example, uh, you might think that there's no aspects for which you have to consider on uh, environmental, but there's an element of it that you only discover when you're now going through the DD, which is how big is the sales force? How frequently are they driving? How frequently are they flying? So what is the extent of their carbon emission? And then you're like, oh no, we didn't think about the environmental part and you need to adjust uh, to ensure that you can accommodate those uh, different elements and aspects. Great, thanks Langa. 
Um, I just want to be conscious of time. I think I'm going to ask one or two more questions, um, but no, knowing that we are running very short on time here. Um, but, you know, I think there's a lot of value in, in some of these questions. Um, next question is for, for Misha. Um, and this question is from Frank. Um, in SA, is it just the exchanges and regulators driving improved ESG reporting? Are there any penalties or incentives that are, are driving this behavior? Has improved ESG performance trickled down into other business metrics, share prices of listed um, entities, for example? Thanks, Adam, and thank you, Frank, for the question. Um, I think that it's definitely one driver of the ESG um, movement, if I can call it that. But definitely, you're getting um, you're getting uh, retail um, um, consumers who are really a lot more savvy about the effect that their decisions have on the environment and society. Um, you have a lot of uh, millennial investors that are moving slowly into the uh, that cohort moving in as investors, and they're asking these difficult questions as well to to their their fund managers, and so. That's not the only driver by any means, but it, um, it definitely is a signal to the market. Um, for instance, the, the Reg 28 regulation recently gives the signal to the market that you know, infrastructure is good for, is good for this sort of societal um, benefit. Um, yeah, so that was just one, one, of my, one of the stakeholders and recommendations from the ITF report mentioned. Great, thank you, Misha. And then just one last question, and I'll, I'll direct this one towards Moisa. Um, and this is from, from Tom. Um, how good is the momentum in frontier African exchanges towards building a regulated system for reporting on uh, measuring ESG, um, impact investing, and other IFI strategies? Are there criteria standardized across different African countries? Should they be? And that's coming from Tom. <laughs> That's a very complex question. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> um, I think the first thing what we've observed in terms of the exchanges, um, there's the, the Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative, which has been very helpful in terms of, um, you know, uh, that initiative gal galvanizing all these various stock exchanges across the world, not just Africa. And we've seen um, some of the, you know, in the countries that we have covered, uh, many of those are actually part of the Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative. And I think it makes it a bit easier to kind of get to the standard that everyone is looking for. It's almost like the holy grail to say, oh, we don't have standard, you know, metrics, we don't have standard uh, objectives. So I think through that initiative, but also like maybe bottom up pressure from investors wanting to be able, you know, to understand um, what they want from investing companies especially in the listed space, that's where you see, uh, I think, a lot of um, uh, momentum coming from. And um, should they be um, standardized? I think to a certain extent, yes, they should be. Um, it's a bit of a yes or no answer. They should be because when you're now looking at you know, investors, they, I'll give you an example in terms of Southern African investors who now want to also invest, have a, a, you know, the ability to invest outside of South Africa, for instance, but on the continent, they need to be able to have a look at two different portfolio companies in, you know, in Nigeria and in South Africa and make a buy or, you know, short uh, decision around a particular stock. So the standardization really helps there. But I think it needs to be done within reason and, and thoughtfully as well, because, you know, um, I think it was alluded to in terms of the impact in terms of, you know, what are the key areas of concern in terms of sustainability from an environmental and a social perspective in these different markets. So, you know, you can't always have a standard, <laughs> you know, metric that will be applicable both to, you know, Rwanda and even Tanzania in the same region. So, um, yeah, so I think that's my response in, in terms of that. Great, thanks. And then I'm just gonna ask one last question and, and direct this one towards Malcolm. Um, this is from Carl. Uh, Malcolm, um, the ESG assessment and engagement process is vastly different between um, asset managers and PE, um, um, PE investors, I'm assuming GPs. Is there any crossover or do they exist in different silos? Um, no, there, there, there definitely are some crossovers because the definitions of, you know, the different ESG factors are the same. Um, and in many ways, you know, uh, 
a private equity or an unlisted investment is just a, an investment that at some point might become listed at some point. Um, and so uh, it, it, there shouldn't be that much difference. Um, in, in practice, probably you do see quite a lot of difference uh, just because of things like resources available at listed asset managers versus um, unlisted asset managers, you know, the, the sort of time and focus required for the process of, of being a private equity investor versus, versus um, you know, the, the similar processes and time on, on a listed side. Um, but at its underlying, in, at a fundamental level, actually, they'd be pretty similar and, and one could follow the same kind of program to assess the different ES, ES or G factors. Great. Great. Thanks, Malcolm. Um, again, being conscious of time, I think we, we've, we've, we've gone over a bit. So I'm going to take this opportunity um, just to um, close this off. Just to let everyone know that um, the report um, will be made available. You will see it in your inboxes um, early tomorrow morning. Um, I would like to um, convey my thanks to everyone who made this report and event possible. Um, special thanks to the GSB and particularly Stephanie and Luisa. It's been an absolute pleasure working for you for the, uh, working with you over the last two years. Um, thank you to my team at Riskira um, for the research um, and marketing support, um, without, um, without which none of this would, would be possible. Thank you very much, the panelists, um, for your for your discussion and insights. Um, it's really wonderful to hear from those who play such a vital role um, in the industry's development. Um, and of course, I would like to thank everyone for attending this this webinar. Um, I think you know this is an important step, um, and it's you know we are reminded of a lot of work that still needs to be done. Um, we're, we really want to scale is important in this in this industry, um, but it's also it's not just about counting money. It's about making more money counts. And to do that effectively, you know, we need the tools and practices for impact measure and management um, to really maintain the integrity. I think we're, we've learned that from from this barometer and from these discussions. Uh, so that's a very important piece. Um, and yeah, with that, I, I would I, I would really like just to close this off and again thank you everyone for for joining um for joining the webinar and again we will be sharing the report with you all um tomorrow morning thanks again everyone